Welcome to Lesson 6 of AP US History of Colonial Crisis in the British Empire. Throughout all the lessons that we've looked at so far and the things that you've been reviewing in your courses so far, you've seen these colonies become colonies and grow from being colonies into being major, major valuable enterprises on a large global network. Uh, between competing imperial powers. And that process now is going to bring itself into some real dramatic friction as in many ways we will be, without the colonials knowing it, taking our first steps towards the great break, the great division between America and, and England. Now this process starts with a, with a process involving empires more than involving colonies, the notion of war and empire management. And it brings us back to an AP term that you should have covered in your history classes. It's a pretty important term if you're going to speak the language of the historian. And that term is salutary neglect. Salutary neglect is the idea or the, con the notion that at first the colonies were really far away from England and were very small and insignificant. And as such, they were left alone to make their own decisions. Now through the decades, this was a process they got used to. But they didn't stay small. And since they didn't stay small, as they grew, not just in size, but also in value to an empire like England, England then sought to put more control over these colonies. The colonies then resented this as they saw it, changing of the rules of the game from a system that they had liked. Much of this takes place after the English Civil War. Once the English have finished their Civil War and they've reestablished their monarchy and the Restoration period's over and Oliver Cromwell's gone and all those things are done with, then England gets back to the business of essentially managing their colonies as part of a global empire. And that's, in many ways, leads us into our first map up here to look at for the day. You'll notice our map is not merely a map of colonies. It's not really a map of North America. It's a map of the entire globe because you need to understand the British point of view, the imperial point of view, the colonies. The, the small little 13 colonies on the Atlantic seaboard, yes, they're big now, they're not totally insignificant, but they are small, relatively speaking, as England, as London sees them. These colonies are one small part of a far vaster, far larger, very far-flung global enterprise, okay, a global empire, and these colonies are a cog in that, in that machine. From the colonial point of view, of course, they see what they see, which is their world, their lives, their priorities, their concerns. So that's going to be some of the uh, tension that will come up at some point in time. But England begins to, after 1696, regulate these, these colonies more. They try to strengthen their control over the colonies and, and make, make the empire a tighter, more efficient, leaner, meaner administrative unit. That's sort of the idea they're pursuing. And to do this, they put in new regulations. They put it initially in the Board of Trade, which is a stronger customs service whose purpose is designed to stop anyone from trading beyond the mercantilist model. Mercantilism, as you'll recall, or you'll need to study, is the idea that nations should set up colonies, or home countries should set up colonies to transship their resources back to the home country to gather as much wealth from the home country as possible. Well, colonials had been smuggling. They'd been trading outside of just strictly trade with England and uh, the Atlantic seaboard because they could get better prices trading with the Dutch, the Spanish, or the French. The British want to stop that. It's their equivalent of, a, uh, of trying to stop a drug trade, trying to stop what they see as an illegal an illegal business market that they need to put a stop to so that they can keep all that revenue stream heading right back where they think it ought to belong, which is back to the home country, back to England. So the Vice Admiralty Courts are set up for stronger enforcement of the Navigation Acts. The Navigation Acts we discussed in an earlier lesson dealt with ships all having to have English captains or all colonial goods had to be shipped on ships with English captains and English crews, once again trying to control this transit of goods. So they want strict enforcement. They put in essentially new law enforcement agencies over the colonies had never been there before. And then they pass a series of acts, the Woolens, Hat, Molasses, and Iron Acts, all of which forbid the colonials from producing those items. Because if the colonials could not buy them, or the colonials could not make them, rather, they would have to buy them. And who would they buy them from? England. And this translates back into the, not the triangular trade, but the two-way trade model the English so were so completely devoted to, a model in which all raw materials were shipped to England which were then converted into finished goods, which were more valuable than those raw materials originally, which were then shipped back to sell the colonials for a nice markup and profit. So England is trying to make this an airtight model, in an airtight system whereby they can really control the revenue stream and make sure it's all heading back to them. Colonial reactions, well, they, they chafe at this. They resent these kind of impositions upon them, these new institutional controls that they didn't ask for and in their view don't deserve. And the colonial reaction at the biggest level is they don't stop this, they smuggle. And, and these are designed to try to make the colonials 
subservient in some ways on them, designed to raise revenue maybe as well, but the colonials get around it by smuggling. Now, this is not the only thing. The colonials' problem, as they see it, is not just this economic one. They've got a political problem. The political problem involves frictions on the frontier. And this leads us to the Seven Years' War, or as it was known in North America, the French and Indian War. Now, don't let that name fool you because Indians or Native Americans were on both sides. The name is a very Anglo-Saxon colonial point of view name for the war. It's about the war those darn French and Indians are you know, placing on us. But the English and the colonials had their own Indian allies as well. So it's not, it's not really accurate to say it was just a war between French and Indians, a war where the French and Indians all ganged up on the English settlers. That, that would be inaccurate. So you have to be careful with overgeneralizings on that, on that. Where does this war come from? During this imperialist, uh, mercantilist time with this process, all nations that were seeing, all the mother nations, the home countries, were seeking to expand their colonial holdings because that's the only way to expand your revenue and wealth. The world only has so much wealth, you got to get as much as you can. So to get this, they were going to seize territory. Inevitably, they're going to start crashing into one another. They're going to see their territorial boundaries collide. Initially, you had no problems between the Spanish, even though you had the buffer state of Georgia and the shoulders in Spanish Florida and Louisiana and the French in the interior, the Spanish there, and New England, or not New England, but the English there, you initially weren't having a problem with colonies overlapping. After all, these were small dots on the map, right? They were small blips, not a lot of population. But as these colonies grew, particularly the Atlantic seaboard ones, the English ones, they began to push further and further westward. And they were running not just into Native Americans and new tribes they hadn't encountered before, but they began running into the area that the French were claiming as their own. The British, for their part, are claiming what they see as the Ohio Valley. They're claiming all this as being theirs as well, I think along the Ohio River Valley right here. And you can see they're moving beyond that. The French thought that was clearly in what they were claiming as their territories. And the French began building a series of military installations to kind of check or stop, choke off this flow of colonials into these areas. The British send a force of militia, commanded by uh, young George Washington, working as a colonial colonel in the, in the British militia, send them to try to get rid of the French. Washington wins a small victory, uh, ensues at a larger defeat to follow after that, and essentially you wind up having a war start here in North America. <clears throat> now if you look at your, first, your slide in the Seven Years' War, you'll notice that there were four previous wars. England had gained in each of them. Those previous wars had all started overseas in Europe, and some of the fighting had gone on by proxy here. This last war, the Seven Years' War, is actually the only conflict that involves these powers that starts here. It starts here, not in Europe, with the activities in the Ohio Valley on the frontier involving French troops and Washington and Indian Native American factions who are on both sides and kind of want what they want as well. So in this origin, starting the Ohio Valley this way, you've got what is going to mushroom into what you could arguably call the First World War. We call First World War, World War I. This is the first truly global conflict, which saw a conflict being fought in India, in the West Indies, in the East Indies, in Europe, and also here in the New World. So in this conflict, we see the Europeans trying to establish their rule, and they pick the Indians as their allies. The Native Americans, for their part, they use a word that's another important AP term we're talking about, real politic. Real politic with a, with a K, which is pursuing a foreign policy ruthlessly based on your own self-interests. The Native Americans, the League of the Iroquois and the other tribes in, in, uh, in the Northeast, they wound up siding with whoever was winning, or at least whoever they felt could benefit them the most. So initially, the French have the most Indian allies, and the war goes dreadfully for the British at first. They, they have defeat after defeat after defeat after defeat, and you see the colonials are really worried about being thrown back this way, and they question the competence of British military leadership at all. And the, the, the colonials even get to the point of suggesting their own colonial defense force. Benjamin Franklin suggests the Albany Plan of Union, which is almost like a renewed English Confederate, or, uh, New England Confederation that we'd seen earlier during uh, King Philip's War. The idea was to have all the colonies in a pan-colonial defensive force, where they were all going to kind of contribute in all military forces and resources to defend themselves. It gets nowhere. The most famous artifact of this is a cartoon woodcut of a snake chopped in little pieces entitled Join or Die, which was Franklin trying to exhort colonials to say, together as one, we can be strong. But you know what's historically significant? Nobody joined. 
Now that tells you something. The Colonials didn't join, so it tells you they're not ready for this yet. They're kind of, they're too suspicious of the other colonies, they don't know each other very well, and each of the colonies on that map are jealously protective of their own prerogatives to be their own colony. They see themselves as being their own sort of like little miniature nations. And so they weren't ready to throw in and give up some of that liberty. And from the British point of view, the idea of an intercolonial defense force where all these guys here had their own military and making their own military decisions, the British are not keen on that at all. They say, no, 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 no. Leave military decisions to the crown. We'll handle that. We don't like the idea of you establishing your own armies, and because establishing your own armies could lead to dangerous places the British don't want to go, where those armies might resist British authority as well. The British say issues of police matters, issues of military matters, they're reserved for London. And so both sides mutually kind of uh, agree on their own that they don't like this idea and, and it doesn't get anywhere. So the tribal strategy was to essentially try to play the colonials off against one, or play the imperial powers off against one another because the Native Americans of, these region, of this region, they're passionately interested in trying to keep their land as best they can. They wind up siding with the French at first. Ultimately, they shift to the British. And the British wind up at the end of this conflict with a, with a, with a total victory, a victory that is complete. And w when I say complete, what I mean by that is that if you look at the map up here on the, uh, actually contrast both of these maps, you'll see what I mean. The French lose and essentially it's the end of the French Empire in North America. This is the holdings in North America by the great powers prior to the Seven Years' War. The Atlantic colonies are this dark shaded pink area, the French are in the interior Mississippi, Ohio River Valley areas, and the Spanish have control of this Louisiana area. After the French and Indian War, the difference is stark. Notice now, instead of three colors, you have two, right? England has all of this. English victory is total. This is Spanish territory here. Now, English victory being total, though, brings with it some consequences. And in many ways, the greatest irony of this is that winning this victory sets the seeds for the destruction of the British Empire in North America. But nobody at the time knew it. The glue that had held the colonists to their English masters was the necessity of needing their help. They both needed one another to deal with the French and the Spanish and Native Americans. You take away that external glue and there's nothing to hold these sides together anymore. And problems are gonna come from this as we head further down the road.